right, everybody, welcome back to the podcast, back to the video, the YouTube show. Uh, by the way, if you like what we do here, please help support it. Go to patreon.com slash Matt Lewis. I'm happy to welcome back today, friend of the show, friend of Matt, Batya Unger Sargon. Uh, she's an opinion editor at Newsweek and author of a new book, Second Class, How the Elites Betrayed America's Working Men and Women. Batya, good to see you. Thank you so much for having me, Matt, my friend who wrote an amazing book that everybody should check out, Filthy Rich Politicians, which is sort of, in my view anyway, a companion to second class and uh, really gives a lot of background to how we arrived at this terrible situation where working class people are second class citizens. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for, for writing the forward to that book. I really appreciate it. Um, obviously, I think anybody who is paying attention knows that there is a a political reordering that has taken place. Whether you like it or not, um, Donald Trump's success and even current success uh, tied or leading Joe Biden in the polls, I think, is evidence of that. Tell us, if you would, how did we get here? How did how did we get to a point where the Republican Party is now increasingly the party of the working class and the Democratic Party is increasingly seen as the, as the party of college educated elites? Right. So it, it took a long time, but um, that's definitely where we're at. Although I will say it's unclear if it's the Republican Party. It's probably Donald Trump himself. The GOP is going to have to work very hard to keep these working class voters after the Trump era ends, because as we saw in the primary, they were all too keen to throw money at Nikki Haley and try to get her instead of Trump. And she really represents the sort of pre-Trump um, sort of free market, you know, free trade, foreign wars version of the Republican Party that the working class really doesn't like. So, um, you know, the the this realignment is holding for now, but it's it's not clear that the GOP understands why they are getting all these working class voters and whether they're going to be able to keep them after Trump if they don't do a big course correction. Um, we got here because. Um, you know, it was the, the the GOP really never had any pretensions to speaking to labor, to the working class. They always used to be the party of sort of the chamber of commerce and the rich and corporations and free trade and all of this stuff. Um, but um, the Democrats used to represent labor. They used to represent the working class. We can all remember this time, you know, like in the 70s, where working class voters even if they were culturally conservative, it would never occur to them to vote for anybody except Democrats. And what followed was um, a series of policies that were put in place by President Bill Clinton, President Barack Obama, and then President Joe Biden, in which effectively the Democrats um, sold out the working class in order to cater increasingly to these college-educated elites. So for example, when Bill Clinton signed NAFTA into law, this was an absolute disaster for the working class. It effectively shipped 5 million good middle class jobs overseas to build up the middle class of China and Mexico. And then President Obama showed up and said, you know, those jobs really aren't going to be coming back and defunded vocational training in high school, which was another avenue that working class Americans could use to achieve the American dream. The idea for President Obama was, well, everyone will go to college. That will become the way that you pursue the American dream. And of course, that's incredibly fallacious because, first of all, there's a limit to the number of of college educated jobs and economy can sustain. And we hit that limit 10, 15 years ago. So 50% of people with a college degree are underemployed. They're working in jobs that didn't require that degree, although infuriatingly, they're still making more than a working class person in that job. But also a lot of people aren't suited for college, right? They don't want to go to college. And we have a dearth of skilled trades folk in this country. There's a lot of hospitality jobs now in this country. A lot of jobs that are working class jobs that used to secure the American dream and no longer do. And of course, the final piece of that was when Joe Biden opened the border and welcomed in 15 million, you know, basically cartel slaves to compete with working class Americans. Um, and that further drove down the wages of the jobs that remained here. So first they shipped the jobs overseas. Then they said, if you don't have a college degree, you don't get the American dream. And then they imported an entirely new slave caste to compete with the workers here. That's how you ended up with the situation where the, the working class, the multiracial working class is like, 
what am I getting out of being a Democrat anymore? What are they giving me? And the reason that they did this, Matt, to answer your question finally, is because they no longer saw the working class as their base. They saw the people who consume cheap products from China and consume cheap labor from migrants as their base, the over-credentialed college elites, the top 20%, which now controls over 50% of the GDP. So that's you know the, lo the long answer to your question. <laughs> Um, I do want to say for those who are watching on YouTube as opposed to listening, uh, I I turned off. The, there's a weird emoji thing. I don't know if you noticed this, but yeah, but uh, there was. I a thought you were intentionally telegraphing how you were feeling about what I was saying. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was worried that you would think, and the viewers may think that I am not. I uh, I turned this off. There's some stupid feature on the platform we're using where I don't know who would want this. That, that these emojis or whatever they're called show up and I turned it off and it's back now. And so that was not directed at you. It. it can do all sorts of things. Let's see if I can get it to do it now. There's some fireworks, maybe thumbs up. Now, nothing. I don't know. Somehow it was a thumbs down. Anyway, that was not intentional. Um, let me ask you that. I wanted to let's talk a little bit about the book, which I think is interesting, right? So you talk to a whole bunch of kind of working class Americans, cleaning ladies, cops, janitors to write this book. If you would uh, tell us a little bit, a couple stories that really resonate. And then I'm also curious, just from a journalistic standpoint, how you went about reaching out to them, finding them, persuading them to talk to you, that that side of it as well. Sure. Um, so. Um, I'm going to tell you about two people um, who I interviewed. I'm going to tell you about Linda from West Virginia and Amy from Florida. So Linda is a big Trump supporter. Uh, she drives uh, an Uber van. She does, does deliveries. I mean, I'm sorry. She drives a, an Amazon van. She does deliveries for Amazon. Um, and Amy is a certified nurse's assistant, and she lives in Florida. She's gay. She's um, she's not married, but she's been with the same partner for 20, 25 years. Um, and she works in a nursing home. Um, their political views are indistinguishable from each other. Okay. Amy is gay. She's the head of her union shop. Um, she's, um, you know, votes for Democrats. And Linda votes for Trump. And yet their views on the world are very, very similar. Linda, the Trump voter, is extremely pro-gay. She supported her nephew when he came out, when he was kicked out of his home. She supports homeless veterans and, and building affordable housing for them. She doesn't understand why working class people can't get help with groceries. It really bothers her. Um, you know, th th and she's a Trump voter. And Amy, who's gay, thinks that parents who take their children to drag shows should be put in prison. She doesn't think anyone should be allowed to transition before 18, possibly after that as well. Um, she is very worried about illegal immigration. She doesn't understand why we're funding the war in Ukraine. And she admits that Trump put money in her pocket. And by the way, her long term partner um, is a Trump voter, a Trump supporter. Um, this is the American working class. What I found was people who were radically diverse and yet extremely unified in their views on the world. And of course, if Amy and Linda met, they would get along completely. It would never occur to them to hold it against each other that they vote for the other party, precisely because they know that much more unites them than divides them. And how did you go about finding these people and sort of earning their trust to talk to you? Um, Everyone was unbelievably generous with their time and their views. They were, a few of them were very flattered that somebody cared what they thought. They felt like they were never asked for their opinion. Um, and they were really grateful for the opportunity to share their stories. I asked them things that were very, very, very personal. Like, how much money do you make? You know, what is your family life like? You know, what are the things you're worried about? What are the things you're excited about? Um, what are the things you're worried about not being able to give your kids? These are really personal questions. And they were unbelievably, unbelievably generous and they're now writing back to me. I sent them all each a copy of the book, obviously, and they really are liking the book. And I, I can't tell you how humbling that is because, you know, somebody at, at um, an event asked me, well, did you show them what you were writing about them before you published it? And I said, well, actually, no, because that's a big journalistic faux pas. We don't believe in doing that because we're supposed to be servicing our reader, not our subject. Um, but it was scary because there was a part of me that was like, 
will they mind being called second class? I mean, I didn't know the title of the book when I was doing the interviews. Will they mind how I portrayed them? Will they be, you know, afraid? You know, they said things in interviews and then to see it in print, but the reaction has been like just deeply humbling. I'm, I, I'm so grateful to God that it came out like this and that I was able to write it in a way that they feel proud to have participated in it. How I found them was I wanted to, to include people who were representative of larger trends. And the funny thing is one of the trends that I noticed when I was reporting it, I thought was wrong, but now is turning out to be kind of like prescient. I mean, I, I didn't find a single black man who was planning to vote for Biden. And I found a lot who had a lot of nice things to say about Trump. And I thought at the time, like, that can't be right. Like the polling is not, but now the polling is like pretty much backing that up. So, um, you know, it's funny when you really do the work and try to find a representative sample, people will tell you things that then later turn out to be true, even when your own confirmation bias is saying this can't be true. But what I did was I wanted, I started with data. So there's a professor at Brigham Young University called Joe Price, and he has a team of grad students and he will hire them out to journalists. And I asked them to look at the American Census Survey at, in 2000 and in 2020, so I could get a, a sense of a trend. And I asked them for a bird's eye view of the working class. Who is the working class? How old are people? What races are they from? Where do they live? How much money do they make? What jobs are they in? What is the rate of home ownership in each job? So that bird's eye view is represented in the introduction. So I give that to the reader. And I then knew kind of what I was looking for because I had a sense of who these people are, right? So I knew that there were 3 million truckers and I needed to find a trucker, at least one, although there's two in the book because truckers are poets and they're really great at representing, you know, they spend a lot of time alone with their thoughts. And so they, they're they really good at representing sort of the inner monologue of, of the working class. Um, you know, I knew that I needed people who were working pink jobs, you know, working in, in, in healthcare. I knew that I needed retail people, fast food workers, like, because I knew what the breakdown was. I also knew that I needed, I wanted inter to interview cleaning people, but 50% of cleaning people of maids are homeowners. So I needed to find at least one who was a homeowner, right? If I was going to have one who's struggling, which I do in the book, there are a number who are struggling and one who's a homeowner because I didn't, I wanted to give as accurate a reflection of that data set as I could by telling stories that would give the readers like, I feel like there's people, you know, when you meet Linda and Amy, you're never going to forget them. You know, there's something about these people that really sticks with you, um, but also provides a larger window. You know, both of them struggle with, with covering healthcare costs. Um, Linda, however, is going to become a homeowner in a few years because what she wants is a double wide and she lives in West Virginia. And if she sticks with Amazon, which she says is the best job she's ever had, she doesn't have a high school degree, she will be able to buy that double wide in a few years. And Linda is an amazing person because she lived through this whole process. So her, she used to be a homeowner. She and her husband had a home. His factory was shut down and shipped off to China and they lost their home because they literally lived through this kind of dis destruction of the working class through globalization, through NAFTA and offshoring and all of this. And she's now clawing her way back in her 50s, feeling very optimistic that she will become a homeowner. Uh, Amy, even though she makes a little more than than um, Linda, will never be a homeowner. She lives in Florida and it's just there's no it's just it's beyond. She has no savings for retirement because her deductible is $3,500 a year. And every year, every penny she saves goes to medical bills, right? So this is another, you know, real struggle for the working class. Is that their, still the American dream, homeownership? I would say the way most people defined it, it was owning a home, being able to cover your bills without worrying, um, a vacation now and then, some people brought up um, a retirement and your children having at least as many opportunities as you did. And and so there are definitely working class people who are profiled in the book who have the American dream 100%. It's not that it's totally out of reach. Um, it's that the way people would say it is you can do everything right. You can make all the right choices and still only have a 50-50 shot. And it's beyond their ability. I mean, these people work so hard, Matt. Like Amy does not understand why she will never be a homeowner. You know, she knows she did everything right. She worked every day of her life. She works so hard in a job that gives her a lot of dignity, um, taking care of old people, you know, changing their diapers every night, making sure that they are living in dignity. And as Americans, we are so lucky 
that we have people like Amy who want to do this job, who get self-esteem from doing this job, and yet what we're not giving her in return the most basic form of security. It's funny. I've heard you say something on this book tour that reminds me of something. My So my mom lives in Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. She voted for Trump in 2016, drove people to the polls. And I found it quite troubling because I talked to her the night before the election and told her, <laughs> I think Donald Trump's an authoritarian. Mm -hmm. I know these people. Like I know Kellyanne Conway. I know a lot of the people in his orbit. They're not good people. Um, and she voted for Trump the next day and drove people to the polls. And I actually had her, I interviewed her and had her on my podcast. And I asked her why. And um, I'm paraphrasing, but she said, the people of Western Pennsylvania, want dig they want their dignity. They don't want handouts. They want jobs and they want their dignity back. And I've heard you um, say, say a very, something very similar to that in regards to what working class Americans actually want. Go Mama Lewis. I mean, she she nailed it. Um, before Trump, you had one party that represented the rich and one party that represented the educated rich. And the Democrats idea for the way the economy would work is you go to college, you get multiple degrees, you enter the knowledge industry, and then you start making, you know, one hundred and fifty to five hundred thousand dollars a year. And that's where, you know, the workers of America should be. In fact, they believe these people should be unionized. It's hysterical. And anybody else who doesn't go to college, they consider the poor and they are happy to pay higher taxes to support these people on food stamps and welfare and affordable housing and so forth, universal basic income. They want to pay off the working class to not work. And what they'll do is import, you know, a slave caste from Venezuela and other failed socialist states to be, you know, enslaved to the cartels and work service industry jobs that the college educated think are beneath contempt, and then do all of the manufacturing in China and have it brought in for cheap. That's kind of the economy, the way that the Democrats picture it. And that's why they see themselves as the good guys, because they're willing to give, you know, the thing is, Working class people do not want that. They get a lot of dignity and self-esteem from the fact that they work really, really hard. And in fact, they have a lot of resentment to people who they see as living off the government and choosing not to work. You know, the de a lot of the dependent poor who they feel made a choice not to work, work to the working class, people would t talk about it in spiritual terms. Like it was a kind of inheritance from their parents that they were so proud of. They would see their parents getting dressed for work every day and they really believe in it. And the thing that makes these jobs undignified is not the work itself, which I mean, Matt, I'm sure you agree with me. There's it's godly, right? To, ha to work, to work with old people, to work in cleaning, to these jobs have this inherent dignity to them. What makes them undignified is that they don't pay a living wage. And these people work and work and work and cannot afford the basic tenets of security. That is the problem there. And your mom just nailed it. They want their dignity back. And what the left does is portray this as some sort of like return to the good old boys, racist. We need to be doing better than, you know, black people and immigrants and whatnot. It's nonsense. They're not comparing themselves to other groups. They're comparing themselves to their parents' generation, or even where they were 10, 20, 30, 40 years ago, when things were not quite so hard. Do you believe that it's still possible in America to go from poverty or from nothing to being rich, success, rich and successful, or certainly at least achieving the American dream? A hundred percent. I think, you know, I wouldn't say we've totally achieved equal opportunity. I mean, you know, kids growing up in, in gang ridden slums, for example, um, in inner cities, I don't believe they have equal opportunity. I think there's a lot of poverty in rural America where kids, you know, we're probably leaving a lot of Einsteins in the ghetto and in rural America. However, if you're really, really smart, let's say, or really, really good at, you know, some sport, if you have a talent, right, if God gave you some sort of talent, Chances are you'll be able to make it out and, and even make it very rich. I think that sort of rags to riches story for people who are incredibly talented really is there. The problem is, is that talent by definition is not equally distributed, right? 
And the question is, what happens to everybody else? I mean, why should it be that, you know, equal opportunity means if you have an IQ of 180, you can become rich, but everyone else has to be living, making $40,000 a year and having to call the electric company every month to beg forbearance and create a payment plan, right? The question is, what happens to everybody else? There's something fundamentally godless about worshiping the meritocracy in that way, because most people are average. Like that, that's just how, like, that's just, I don't know, nature, science, God. I mean, that's how it is, right? So we have to have a plan. And by the way, you know, yes, our society is great. You know, we get a lot of, you know, great innovations from the talented, from people who are extraordinary. I'm so grateful to them. But our society fundamentally relies on the labor of the ordinary, right? I mean, that's just, we would all starve if all of the ordinary people died tomorrow. If all of the extraordinary people died tomorrow, we'd probably be okay. I mean, we wouldn't have any more innovations in medical fields, which I'm grateful for. But you know, we wouldn't all starve to death within a month. And I I think that is the thing that bothers me so much is, you know, the hubris of this college credentialed elite who believe that they everything they got is through their own merit and therefore deserved and therefore they deserve to rule and to sneer at average people when average people are the thing that we all rely on to survive. We should treat them with dignity. Something you said uh, just now reminded me of something in uh, for, Filthy Rich Politicians that I talked about, which is like being poor is really expensive. Like, totally. you know, I had a time in my life when I was young when, cause you know, I, my dad was a prison guard and I went to a little college in West Virginia. My parents did a lot to help me, but at a certain point, you know, there just wasn't money to float me forever. I had to kind of make it on my own. And, and I mean, I've had experience where you, you know, you have to borrow money or you don't have enough money to pay a parking meter. So you get a $25 ticket. You don't have enough money to get, um, you know, to get a, a sticker for your license tag. And so you get a $150 ticket, like it's really expensive to be poor. Yeah. And that's part of the reason I think the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And you're obviously missing out on opportunities to invest. Um, and I do think there are people born on third base who think they hit a triple as well. So uh, this definitely, res- some of this resonates with me. And I say that because Next, in a minute, I do want to challenge you with a few. I think you'll be able to answer them. Don't get me wrong, but I, I want to present a few challenging thoughts and questions. But first, let me ask you this. So you've, we've talked about how um, you know Republicans and Democrats have both kind of not been great for a lot of working class Americans. Where are you on RFK Jr., who I think presents maybe a third option? I think Trump is the third option. <laughs> I mean, I think he's really if you if people could put his personality aside, they would see that he is basically a pro labor Democrat from the 90s. And, you know, just policy, just look at his policy. And so to me, that's the the kind of that's the center right there. RFK Jr., his campaign is so muddled. I mean, I can't tell what he stands for. It's really funny because obviously there was a lane here um, and he had the name recognition when he first showed up, but it's all so contradictory. Um, you know, he talks about the middle class, but his whole climate agenda is class warfare against the working class. You know, he's he he. This, I think the vaccine skepticism over COVID was really big for a lot of American populists, but he's not a COVID skeptic. He's anti-vax, like that's and that's really like a non-starter for most people. He he approached Tulsi Gabbard for vice president, which is genius. Whoever gets Tulsi Gabbard is going to go really far. I, I hope Trump picks her. I don't know if he will, but but she turned him down. And then he went in the opposite, in the complete opposite direction and took this woman, Nicole Shanahan, who is a funder of illegal immigration. Um, George Gascon, who's one of these pro-criminal DAs, she raised $150,000 for him for, for his. So he kind of then went in. The, so I can't see the the lane here, except just that it's like trading on the name recognition. Um, I feel a little bit like, well, if you I know that he did a lot of advocacy, but the the causes he chose, like the climate stuff and the VAC stuff, it really does not speak to the middle class issues that he wants to now represent. 
And so I I feel really confused by it. And like there was a lot of missed opportunity there that stems from having been born on third base and not really having any idea what regular Americans are struggling with. Um, So I I, I really feel really confused by it. You know, like he'll get up there and do one of those land recognition things, which, you know, like when they say I'm I want to when he announced that he was coming out as an independent, I believe it was then that he he announced it by saying, I want to acknowledge we're standing on land of the whatever Native American tribe it was. Which is like just like the most virtue signal of virtue signals. Um, yeah. So I, 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 and I think honestly, I think, you know, at first it looked like, you know, Black Americans who are really not getting a lot out of the Biden presidency were really sort of trending toward RFK Jr. But I think a lot of them now are sort of trending toward Trump. So I, I, I don't really know what to make of it, is I guess what I'm trying to say. What do you think of RFK Jr.? Oh, I don't like him. I think oh. he's a crank, but yeah. <laughs> but I wouldn't like him because I'm a conservative, right. you know, Republican. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not a big fan, but I do think that there is a hunger out there for another option. Someone who's not 100 years old. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he does have he's not a politician, despite right. the lineage. He comes across as a little different, not not as a polished politician type. So I I think he does have an appeal. Um, And my guess is that he could definitely play spoiler and help Donald Trump get elected. Yeah, I also have to say I this is like a totally like elite, like preoccupied, like, obviously, like, but he he strikes me as humorless. And I consider that to be like, just a cardinal sin. I mean, it just like, like the 11th commandment is thou shalt have a sense of humor about thyself. And um, so I I object on that level as well, although only sort of, you know, among friends. (laughs) All right. Um, so let me I, I want to, you know, throw some not, you know, these aren't going to be like gotcha questions or anything. I think you'll be able to, you know, fin them or at least respond to them. Uh, but I have a few. But I want to start with like a statement just to have you respond to. So, you know, early on, you sort of presented um, Nikki Haley and traditional Reagan conservatism as being kind of like warmongers and all this other stuff. Um I just want to say, as someone who is a traditional Reagan conservative, our policies may be good or bad. They may work or they may not. And But for a lot of us, um, believing in lower taxes was a belief of letting the American people keep more of what they earn instead of sitting at the government. Um, we're not warmongers. We're not into foreign adventurism. What we do believe is in a strong national defense that America should be a force for good in the world, that we should support our allies like Israel and Ukraine uh, against bullies, and that appeasement doesn't work. Mm -hmm. Um, And we believe in character, which Donald Trump doesn't have, decency and integrity, and that these things are actually important, that, 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 uh, that someone's personal character really matters. Um, So, I feel like you you were presenting a caricature of old school, like Nikki Haley Republicanism. And I'm sure there are some people, don't get me wrong, who represent that. But I think that what you said is actually, Tucker Carlson says this, Charlie Kirk, like this has become a caricature and, and a stereotype that I think has like gotten out of hand, in my mm-hmm. opinion. Mm-hmm. So how would you respond to that? Um, so first of all, I'm so grateful for your friendship because like knowing people like you who I consider to be deeply honorable people like forces me when I'm steering too much into this caricature to sort of be like, okay, Batia, like you you know that Matt believes this stuff and he is an honorable man. So you have to address it in a way that is not a caricature. So I I really first of all, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to 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 say to respond to this and also for your friendship more generally, because I'm sure I infuriate you a lot on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> but um so I, I, what I would say to that is taxes, very interestingly, did not come up a lot when I was talking to working class Americans. Um, Health care came up, but not taxes. Um, I, I, I think keeping taxes low for the middle class, they like that. And that was not one of the and I didn't mention when I said like, you know, free markets and free trade, I wasn't necessarily talking about taxes. I think it's yeah. complex. Well, I would also say that yeah. in terms of free of free markets and free trade, 
I'm sure there are people out there who were very cynical about it and, and ex exploitative about it. But I think there's a, a very plausible argument that free markets and free trade have a net positive effect for America, including American consumers. And that if you're trading with another nation, then you're not fighting with them. And it, it, it breeds cooperation and interdependency. And so I, I think that um, to attribute sort of malice to people who believe in free trade, which I think has become very easy for people to do, it's, you can score political points real easy. And I feel like it's kind of un, unfair. So the argument that I made in the book is that things like NAFTA had a disastrous impact on the ability of working class people to achieve the dignity that I know you and I both want them to have. And I think the data really supports that. Of course, NAFTA was signed into law by a Democrat. Um, so uh, not necessarily laying that at the feet of Republicans. But um, I guess I would ask, I don't need the malice piece, but can you admit that maybe that was not good and that there can that when when things like mass immigration or free trade while they do raise the gdp in the aggregate that is not equally distributed across american society and the data to me definitely seems to suggest that the gains of all of that have gone to the top 20% and have been deeply punishing for working class americans who work much harder than the top 20% and that perhaps there was a mistake there that is being righted by an economic agenda that is more focused on the Americans who work really hard and do not have access to the American dream the way that we do. Well, I mean, I, I'm, first of all, I'm totally open to persuasion. Second of all, I would say, and, and I have the same argument in terms of immigration, like it may well be that, um, the more immigrants, the better. But if a lot of Americans don't feel that way, and right. if it causes them to vote for Donald Trump, then it's a problem, right? Like, like if it is radicalized- You people... actually believe in democracy. Like that statement you just said is lost on the vast majority of the punditry class, which is like, I may like something, but if most Americans don't like it, it is bad for the country. Like that statement, like, you don't understand how mind-blowing it is when somebody can actually say that, because that is literally the bedrock of democracy, and nobody believes that anymore. I do think it's an important aspect. Like, I wrote a column at the Daily Beast a year or two ago saying, um, I know that the Iraq war was a mistake. And the reason I know it is that Donald Trump <laughs> got elected. <laughs> like, that is proof. Uh, you, anyway, it's a little different, but no, I, I think that... Um, if if there are a lot of Americans who are deeply upset about something, then that doesn't mean we have to defer to them necessarily, but we need to take them seriously and we need 100%. to listen to them. So 100 percent. Yeah. Now, am I correct? You have seven minutes a hard out. Yes. Am I right? OK, yes. let me go through some of these. I may not get through all of them, um, but we'll do sort of a lightning round. But I'd love to get your, your feedback. OK. Is it possible that you might be bestowing unearned political wisdom to people based ironically on their lack of education and experience? I mean, it's not college educated elites who elect dangerous idiots. I'm reading here, reading my own writing, who elect dangerous idiots like Marjorie Taylor Greene or Lauren Boebert. Um, I, this is the accusation I get most from the libertarians is that I, I, I <clears throat> abandoned racial wokeness in order to become woke on behalf of the working class. Um, <laughs> I, I don't accept that view because I think my sort of desire to foreground the voices of the working class is not to give them any unearned wisdom, but to do what you just did, which is to say that in a democracy, if 70 percent of the population wants something, it is extremely dangerous for that to be out of reach because an oligarchy of the top 10% doesn't like it. And that is the situation we're in right now. And I find that to be extremely dangerous as an American, as a Jew, and as a person who really believes democracy is like the only way that is fundamentally dangerous to the sp stability of our democracy. So whether I agree with them or not, I, I don't need them to be wise, although the people I met were unbelievably smart about policy 
especially economic policy in a way that the elites that I know are not. Like we just don't sit around thinking about trade because we're the beneficiaries of it. And they, as the people who paid for it, they are so smart on economic policy. The way, as you know, Matt, a person with $23.60 in their bank account is very smart about money. And so I like, it's not unearned wisdom. It's the people who like deserve to have their say and have been silenced um, and whose interests have been really abandoned. So that I, that, yeah, I hope that's that, that that's answers. good. Uh, almost out of time. I'm going to combine these two um, and hopefully it'll make sense. Is it possible that the working class might understandably be focused on their plight, but their political savior might be a populist demagogue and authoritarian who threatens the foundation of liberal democracy? and I would prioritize liberal, like, like to me, if I'm looking at, if I'm weighing like serious concerns, the survival of liberal democracy and having a person who has character and decency to me in my heart hierarchy um, supersedes the person that I think is going to be better for me and my personal financial interests. How would you respond to that? I would say that, um, the dividing line between people who think that way and people who don't is whether they've had to put groceries back at, while being at the checkout line and seeing the number of the price of groceries go up and knowing exactly how much money is in the bank account. Like if you have had to do that, if you've had to put groceries back on the shelf because you can't afford them, to, this idea of a threat to democracy is just so totally secondary to that. I happen to think the threat to democracy is very overblown. I mean, this guy is the most popular politician in the country, probably. And that's that means that's like a in a democracy, that person would win. The fact that Nikki Haley outspent him two to one in the primary and he still won. I mean, that is what democracy looks like. The fact that the Democrats have waged this campaign against him for eight years and he's still able to, to pull it off. That's what democracy should look like. I mean, it turns out Citizen United. I mean, who knew that Citizens United was not actually going to destroy our economy, that a person could outspend another politician two to one and that politician could still win? I mean, what a remarkable day for American democracy. It's 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 absolutely astonishing. And I, I find I think it, whatever you think of Donald Trump, whatever you think of the threat he poses that fact in and of itself, that the electorate, the sheer will of the people could overcome everything that's been thrown on him at him from both sides. I mean, that should make us feel really good about the resiliency of our democracy. So I think I'm much more concerned about Trump than you are, obviously. But I think where we agree is if you have a country where a large percentage of Americans feel like they're left behind and are having a hard time making ends meet and feel like they uh, don't have the opportunity to rise, then they may make political decisions that you don't like, and they may prioritize things in a way that you wouldn't do it if you uh, are not in their position. So I think that's a great place to end it. Uh, everybody, uh, get the book. It's called Second Class, How the Elites Betrayed America's Working Men and Women. Batya Unger Sargon, thank you for coming back on the podcast. Matt, thank you so much for having me for this delightful conversation, and God bless you and everybody you love. Thank you.